a larger room today. Um, it's it's a great pleasure to have Jeff Hawkins here. Um, he's such an amazing person. He's done, uh, he's contributed to industry in ways that you know, few of us can imagine, with the, the creation of Palm and Trio and so on. Um, but he only, if you explain this to me today, he only did that as a side job. He thought it was only going to take him a couple of years to make some money so that he could go and work in neuroscience. And uh, um, he was a bit successful there, managed to make enough, I guess, to come back to neuroscience in a big way. And um, I first came across his work with uh, his book on intelligence, which I strongly recommend. You can get it via iTunes or Amazon. And um, it's a fascinating um, account of how the brain might work. And today he's going to talk to us about that and uh, about some of the sort of very recent hot developments. Um, thank you for my for being here. It's really a thrill to be at uh, uh, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. It's my favorite part of the world. I'm not joking. Mm -hmm. I'm a sailor and I love this great club here in the islands. And, uh, and every time I've ever been here, it's been gorgeous weather. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Some people say it's like that all the time. Some people say they keep telling me, like, you know, it's never like this. So they like, don't come back. I don't know where it is. <laughs> anyway, and you guys have a beautiful campus. And uh, I've only fairly recently become uh, aware of the computer science and cognitive science work that they have been really impressive. Uh, and I've met some really great people today. And uh, so I'm really thrilled to be here and talking about our work. Um, so uh, I have a uh, talk which I'm going to give called Hierarchical Temple Memory. This is the term we use for our models of the neocortex. And, uh, but I, I, I'm going to do something a little bit unusual. I'm going to give this talk, but I really wanted to talk about something totally new, which has never been presented before. Uh, so you're going to get two talks in one. There's a bonus talk here. Um, and it's really literally structured like that. Uh, I am basically going to do the shortest, most sweetest, in uh, succinct introduction to what I've been doing for most of the last five years uh, about hierarchical temple memory. And then I'm going to go into work that started in October of 2009, last year, only about four months or so, on these new learning algorithms. And this is going to be an interesting challenge for me because it's a, these are uh, difficult things to present, and I've never presented them before, so you're my guinea pigs here. And um, I, I'm going to do my best to try to keep you all engaged. So we're going to go through uh, a short talk, about a third of my time, and then uh, a little bit longer talk, about two thirds of my time. They're all related, but they're physically different um, presentations. Uh, just a couple of goals. These are my personal goals in life. Uh, not my only goals, but my professional goals. Uh, I am interested primarily in understanding how the brain works. That's my number one goal. It's a, it's a biological theory of the neocortex. Um, and uh, I've been dedicating a large portion of my life to that. The secondary goal, and it's secondary, is a belief that if we understand how the neocortex works, we can build uh, machines that work on those principles, and they will be able to solve problems that we haven't been able to solve other ways. Um, now, that's not everyone believes that. People, you know, they don't know if you, people, some people say, you don't need to know much about brains to solve machine learning problems. I think there's many problems in the world that you can't solve unless you really know how brains work. So I'm trying to tackle two of these at the same time. And uh, right now, I'm doing it under the context of a company called Numenta, which is a um, potentially someday profitable enterprise. Uh, but our goal is really to develop a technology based on these, uh, what we call hierarchical temple models, memory models of the neocortex. So we're going to, uh, throughout t t today's talk, we're going to jump in and out some neuroscience. I'm mostly a neuroscience guy who does computer science on the side and machine learning on the side. Um, so I'm going to start with my little brain model here. Um, I carry this around. It's a good way of getting stopped in the airport scanners. It's a big <laughs> block of plastic. Uh, you know, there's, uh, the brain's a very complex organ. There's many components to it. My primary interest is the neocortex. And uh, just to remind you, the neocortex is on a human brain or a mammal brain. It's the outside covering of the brain. Now, all mammals have a neocortex. Non-mammals don't. Uh, it got progressively larger through evolutionary time. So humans have a very large one. Uh, monkeys and other, you know, apes and so on have a medium-sized one. Dolphins have a very large one. The neocortex is primarily associated with most all high-level thoughts. So language uh, is done in the neocortex. High-level vision, high-level motor control, uh, auditory <coughs> processing, somatosensory processing. When you dream and think about things, it's your neocortex. Um, now, um, uh, so this is the organ we want, we want to study. 
and, um, and we, we're going to look at some things about the anatomy of it and how it, how it might work and, and so on. So we're going to jump right into uh, the moment. Well, before I do that, I'll, I'll point out one more thing. It, the neocortex actually is a sheet of cells. It, it's, it's wrapped around the rest of the brain. And if you could remove that sheet of cells, it looks like a dinner napkin. So it's about this big. And it's about, uh, about this thick. It's two to three millimeters thick. And in that sheet of cells, there are roughly 30 billion neurons. And, uh, and so those 30 billion neurons are you, right? My, my cells are talking right now, and yours are listening. Literally, I have a sheet of cells in my brain right now that's making me speak and give, the, give my thoughts. And you're you processing in that same sheet of stuff. Um, one of the remarkable things about this is that there's different regions in the neocortex, and they seem to be doing different things. There's areas involved in vision and hearing and language and motor control and so on. Um, and there are little physically areas of the sheet, but they are, um, uh, they all look very, very similar. That is, if you look at it uh, uh, in detail and you look at the structure of the, the cells and the connectivity, it's very, very difficult to tell one region from the next. And there seems to be a very common algorithm running throughout this. And this was first proposed in 1979 by Vernon Mountcastle, uh, said that, hey, you know what, there's a common algorithm that running throughout the neocortex. And the way we do vision is the same way we do language, is the same way we do touch and somatosensory and, and, and audition. An amazing idea, and it's, uh, I believe this is true, most neuroscientists do. Uh, the people who don't believe it are basically people who just say that can't be true, as opposed to looking at the data. And it's one of those great discoveries that nature has figured out sort of a common way for doing the disparate things we do in the neocortex. It's a common algorithm in some sense, and that makes our job a lot easier. We can now ask ourselves, well, what does this organ do? And it's worth getting, thinking about it at a very high level first. Um, on the right of this picture, you have the brain, the neocortex. On the left, you have the world. I represent it by a box. And there are things in the world. There are people, there's rooms, there's books and cars and so on. Uh, they persist. The world is really real. The brain interfaces to the world through a set of senses. And these are generally planar sensory arrays. So your retina is a planar sensory array. Your skin is a planar sensory array. And your cochlea is a planar sensory array. And all the properties of the world are translated into patterns on nerve fibers. And the nerve fibers carrying sight, sound, and touch are no different from one another. They look identical. So the brain processes patterns. It doesn't process sight and sound and touch. It processes patterns. And what, it, what does it do with those patterns? Well, the answer is it builds a model of the world. When you're born, your neocortex does not know about things in the world. The, there are all, the other parts of the brain have some prior, prior knowledge, but the neocortex doesn't really. It doesn't know about these things, and it has to discover them, and it has to build a model of what's out in the world. We tend to use the word causes for this. Uh, what are the causes in the world? That, that, that you can think of what is the cause, the ultimate cause of the pattern on your retina. And then we want to build a model of causes that matches the world, so that you can make predictions about the world, and you can understand the world. And the question is, how does the cortex do this? We, um, we can break it down a little bit fine and say, what does the cortex do? You can say, first thing, it discovers the causes in the world. It doesn't know that. That, in its own right, is a very valuable thing from a machine learning point of view. What are the underlying causes of data, this data? Why did the weather turn this way? Why did the stock market crash and so on? Then we can do inference. It's just pattern recognition on novel input. So a novel pattern comes in, and you say, what is this? Uh, how does it match my model? Do I understand what this is? Finally, you can use prediction, and we'll talk about this more in a bit. But the, the, the cortex is constantly predicting what's going to happen next. You have constant expectations about what you're going to feel and see and hear, and its model inf instructs that. And what happens is if you follow your predictions, it's thought. So if I sit there and imagine, oh, I have to leave for the airport, I've got to do this, I go here, 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 I'm following a series of predictions based on prior experience. And finally, it can play a role in motor behavior. I'm not going to talk about that today, although some people in the audience would really like to talk about that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today. So, a few more things. I talked about the, the cortical sheet. We talked about these regions on here. Well, the regions are connected together through bundles of nerve fibers. That's the white matter. And so we can, we, and a lot is known about how these regions are connected together. So region A will connect to region B through a bundle of fibers. And region C will connect to region D and so on. We know that those connections are, uh, are, are bi-directional. So if, if one region connects to another region, the other region connects backwards. Uh, those connections are not symmetric. That is, you can tell which is the feed-forward connection and which is the feed-backward connection. And what a lot of neuroscientists have done is they've mapped out all the regions of the brain, and they figured out these connections. And what it looks like in the end, it looks like a hierarchy. That is, there's a clear hierarchical organizations to the regions of the cortex. They're, they all look the same in the individual regions. They all seem to be working the same algorithm, but they're arranged hierarchically. 
Now, I'm not going to show you a picture what that looks like. It's very messy. I'm just going to jump to the bottom line on this. I'm going to show you a sort of a caricature of what hierarchical regions in the cortex might look like. These orange bars are representing a series of uh, uh, regions. These are actually, the size of these came from the visual areas of your brain. So you can think of this as a, the visual area of the inputs to your, to your cortex. But the same is true for auditory and somatosensory. Essentially, you, uh, during this picture here, the sensory data comes in, and it goes to this first region. We call it V1 in the, in the visual system, which is the bottom orange line. Then it gets projected to V2 and up and so on. And, and you end up with this hierarchy. Now, there's a lot of things we know about this. First of all, you see these little arrows on there. These are sort of telling you what the projections are like. They're both feed-forward and feedback projections. But it's not like this is, you know, everything in V1 projects to V2. It's not like that. There's a sort of general convergence as you go up the hierarchy, and there's a divergence as you come down the hierarchy. We know that cells at the bottom respond to very small things in the sensory space. So in vision, they respond to very small parts of the visual field, very small parts of, in, in time, and low, small features. As you move up the hierarchy and you look at cells, these are the same types of cells. They tend to respond to things that are over large areas of the receptive field, large areas of visual space, for example, and over things that occur over long periods of time. And you work, as you go up, you work towards higher and higher causes. You, you'll find at the top of these, these hierarchies representations for words and people and faces and dogs and things like this, high-level concepts. So somehow the brain builds up these representations through a hierarchical representation like this. We kind of view this as a, a memory system. It's not like a computer. It's a memory system. It's a hierarchical memory system that figures out what are the underlying causes in the world and builds it in a hierarchy. Now, we've talked, I've written about this and talked about it, and there's papers about it, and, and uh, I'm going to give you the simplest explanation of how this all works. It's in one slide. Uh, I told you it's going to be a short first talk here. Um, we call it hierarchical temporal memory, and essentially each node in the hierarchy, again, I've shown a little, a little caricature on the left here of another sort of hierarchical temporal memory, these sort of converging hierarchy and diverging coming back down. Um, we feed in a time-based data stream. So it's important. You'll see why in a moment. It's really important that you have to see things moving through time. That's part of the theory. And, and we can now ask ourselves, what does each node do, and how does it work in the hierarchy? Remember, I'm arguing that every little box in this hierarchy is doing the same thing. I'm not the only one arguing that. That's basic. A lot of people believe that. So what is an individual node doing in this hierarchy? And um, we can break it down to three basic ideas. The first idea is it's looking at a whole bunch of patterns come in. These are very complex sensory data patterns coming in. And it has to it look for common spatial patterns. That is, things that occur together at the same time tend to have the same cause. So you can say, look, this occurs at the same time as this occurs. That's a spatial pattern. I want to remember that. The second thing it does, it looks for sequences of those spatial patterns. So it's like, think of like a melody. It says, what typically follows what? And, um, and the idea here is that things that are close together in time are causally related as well. So, you know, if something occurs right after something else, over and over again, we can, we can pretty much assume they have a common cause in the world, and we can represent them as a single thing. They're not, they're not something separate. So I want to learn how sequences move through time. And then finally, we form stable representations of the sequences. You can think of this in a very simplistic way, like the name of a melody. So I hear a song, and I say, oh, I know the name of that song. You want to form a stable representation. The name of the song does not change throughout the, the sequence of the song. And the way this works is that if you take the output of a node, which is the name of the, <coughs> of the melodies or the little sequences it knows, you pass it into the next level up the hierarchy. And the next level now is looking at spatial patterns of sequences and then looks for sequences of those. And then you go up and you look for spatial patterns of sequences and the sequences of those. And what will occur here, if you do it right, and that's a big if, if you do this right, you'll create a... Um, a hierarchical model of causes. Uh, you'll, f you'll find temporal stability as you go up the hierarchy. So as you go up the hierarchy, you'll find that patterns are stable for longer and longer periods of time. So fast changing down at the bottom, they get coalesced in time and coalesced in time and coalesced in time. If you bring the, 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 the if you play it backwards, you sort of unfold sequences in time. That's what I'm doing when I'm speaking right now. I am essentially playing back sequences of sequences. So I have sentences and words and, and, and phrases and ideas, and there's a hierarchy of sort of spatial patterns or temporal patterns that I use to make a talk. Um, we model this in very many ways. You can think of this as a sort of a, a, a class of a Bayesian model. 
And so it, it, the, the simplest way of thinking about that is there can be a lot of ambiguity at the input or any particular node, and all the other nodes reach the most logical uh, belief of what is going on here. So you can have occlusion and noise and messiness and so on, and this whole system very rapidly in a single pass reaches sort of the, the right stable representation. Um, there's a concept here uh, that it's going to be important in the, next, the, the second talk, is, which is how does it, why is this hierarchy important? And this is the little point here I say generalizes due to sharing in a hierarchy. Why is this important? Um, it turns out that the way that you, you, you're exposed to so much data in the world, uh, it, it's unbelievable, and it never repeats twice. And the reason the hierarchy is important is it allows us to be efficient in training and in storage. Essentially, we get to reuse components at lower levels of the hierarchy. So if I learn a speech, I do not need to learn new words. And if I learn uh, you know, um, uh, new words, I don't need to learn new phonemes and things like that. It, we, we are able to share these representations at each point as we go up the hierarchy. And this is essentially the key to how we generalize and how we f form efficient representations and how it is I don't have to train on everything and I can generalize to new things I haven't seen before. So I've never been in this room before, but I have expectations about how it behaves and what you guys are going to do and when you're going to want to walk out and things like that. Now, this model of hierarchical temporal memory um, is similar to a lot of other models that have become around in recent years. Uh, I, I point that as a, 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 as a point, of, as a positive thing about it. That a lot of machine learning people are, are coming to the belief that, um, you know, the way the brain works or how we have to solve problems, you have to have hierarchical representations, and that time is important. I mentioned some models down here, like hierarchical hidden Markov models, HMAX, VizNet, Deep Belief Nets, from your Canadian's own Jeff Hinton. Um, these are all models that in some way deal with spatial or temporal characteristics in hierarchies. Some are learning, some are not learning, some don't do the spatial characteristics and so on. What's unique about HTM is that it's the, it's the whole McGill. It's an online learning system with uh, spatial, temporal, and hierarchy, and uh, it's a learning system, and it's very biologically based. Okay, but the good news is we're all working in the same direction, and this is sort of uh, the belief that brains are basically work on some of these principles. My work is very biologically based, and I'm, you're going to see that especially in the second talk here. Um, I want to tell you, just jump to conclusion. We've been at this for five years at Numenta, and what have we done? Uh, have we accomplished anything? Well, we have. Um, we've, uh, we've produced a lot of software. Uh, almost all of this people can, you can download for free. Uh, we have a low-level envi development environment called NewPIC, uh, which allows you to build these models and test them and so on. We have several things related to vision. We have a vision framework and a vision toolkit. Uh, I'll show you examples of those in a second. These are specifically designed for vision type, uh, spatial vision types of problems. Um, and we have a, a number of companies we've been working with over the years applying this to different problems. Uh, so here's a list of some of the applications we have worked on successfully. Uh, most of these successfully. We've done a sort of click, uh, click prediction on websites, you know, following people as they click through websites, where are they likely to go next, and where are they going to, given the higher order temple statistics about, you know, where are a typical type of user, and then we can characterize the type of users and what they're likely to click on and so on. We've worked with a company on doing uh, and analyzing failures in power systems, like on aircraft carriers and things like that. We've run uh, some uh, a successful application doing uh, uh, and analyzing defects on semiconductor wafers. We are currently trying to uh, work on a problem in credit card fraud detection with a bank in Spain where they have huge themes of uh, uh, basically data about your card purchases. Well, if you lived in Spain, you would be. Um, and they're trying to, trying to basically follow, like, are, what are the underlying causes and can I predict anomalies in people's purchase patterns, things like that. Uh, we've done some work in audio and with some car companies and some video. I'm going to show a couple of pictures of these. We've done a lot of experiments. Some of this have we published. Some of it uh, you can find on our website, and some of it uh, is, we haven't. But uh, we've been basically trying to explore this field, see where, what works and what doesn't work. I'll show you just a couple of pictures. This will give you an example of some of the vision tools. You can download this stuff where you can create um, basically very easily. Non-programmers can create very simple uh, uh, vision uh, recognizers. This is a one that recognizes four different categories of objects, cows, cell phones, rubber ducks, and sailboats. And you can experiment with transformations and noise and occlusion and whiteout and so on. Um, this, uh, we've done a lot of work in this area, and some of these are very easy to use tools. The vision framework is a, more of a programmer's interface to that. We've done some work, again, in the image space with uh, a company called Biomagine. This is doing, uh, looking at uh, digital cell pathology and trying to recognize different types of cell uh, types and tissue types, and that's been uh, reasonably successful. And then finally, um, 
Uh, we have a company called Vitamin D that's been working with us for, uh, for, for a few years. They've built a really fun app, and, and this is, you can download this and, and try it. It's free uh, for the, the basic model. And it's a lot of fun. Basically, this is, in this picture on the upper right here, you, you hook it up to any kind of webcam, and it finds people moving around in, in videos. And it tracks them, and you can put all kinds of rules on them, like, well, tell me if someone stays in this area for more than five seconds. Uh, and let me know if someone walks through this door, things like that, and they'll send you messages. And it's very fast, and it's kind of fun, and they've got a lot of fun applications that have come out of that. So you can try, I encourage you to try and give that a shot. But they're using our uh, vision network in the, in, the, in the core of this to basically recognize people uh, walking around. Okay, I'm almost at the end of my short talk, and then I'm going to get to my long talk. Um, if you want to learn more about this, uh, then I mentioned my book, you can read my book. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter, you can download the software, you can read our, uh, our papers. Uh, we've, uh, we always have lots of interns at Nementa, if you're interested in that. Um, uh, after hearing me speak today, let me know, and, um, and we, have, uh, we like doing that as well. Okay, um, so that's the end of my first talk. No applause here, because I'm not done, we've got a lot to do. Um, in the fall of 2009, uh, we had what I consider a real breakthrough. And, uh, and I'm going to tell it to you today, and it's, it's going to be a challenge for me to convey it to you today. It's a lot of material, it's a little bit conceptually difficult, uh, but I'm going to give it a shot, and I'm going to try to make it as intelligible as I can. And I know that there are some people in the audience who will really find this interesting, because I've been talking to them earlier today. Um, for those of you that, that this is not as interesting as you might think it would be, I would, you can at least walk away from how we do work, how we merge neuroscience with machine learning, and, and is that a good approach, and what is its pluses and minuses, because that's what we're going to do. I'm going to actually be doing a fair amount of neuroscience in this talk. Uh, we'll assume you know nothing, but I'm going to try to walk through that. So um, the, the, the essence of this is that the core learning algorithms inside of an HTM, it's the same HTM, it's the same basic idea, nothing has changed from what I just told you. But those ideas about how you learn sequences, how you do learning spatial patterns, and how you do uh, learn the names of sequences is what we're going to talk about in detail. Okay, as we've done our work, the key challenge we've had, the most difficult thing we've had, is these learning algorithms, the core learning algorithms. It sounds simple. Uh, just to review one more time here, we're talking about what's happening in a particular single node. I have a pointer here. I can use my pointer. So we have the hierarchy of memory nodes, and we're talking about what's going on in a single portion of this, the single part, a little part of the cortical sheet, the short sheet of cells, in one region here. And I said earlier, we have to learn common spatial patterns. We tend to use the word spatial pooler for that. It's essentially you're taking different spatial patterns that are similar, and you're putting them together. That's why we call it spatial pooling. And then we learn common sequences. We call that sequence memory. And then we form these stable representations of sequences, which is, again, like the name of the melody. But we call that temporal pooling. Uh, and the idea there is we have different spatial patterns that occur in time, and we want to, f we want to pool them together, even though they're spatially not overlapping. They're very different things, but we're going to say that they're the same thing because they occur together in time. And then the output of the, spatial, uh, the temporal pooler becomes the input to the spatial pooler in the next level. So you take the output of the, the temporal pooler, you feed into the spatial pooler the next level. So I'm going to use these terms now going forward uh, for those three basic things. So why is this so hard? Um, well, it's, it really is hard. First of all, you have to imagine you're like a piece of cortex, right? And you've got maybe a thousand or several thousand axons coming in, and these spikes coming in on you. It's, it's raw data. And you've got so thousands of, or hundreds or thousands of input elements. They be, they, it never repeats. It, you're never going to have the exact same pattern on those things twice. So you have this continually changing data stream. Um, it's noisy. It's noisy because the world is noisy. Uh, it's noisy because neurons are noisy and they're, and they're stochastic, but just the, on its own, the world is noisy. You know, it, it, the world doesn't look noisy to you. It looks really clean. That's because you're already perceiving what's going on. But if you actually look what's coming off the, brand, off the, off the eye or off the ear, it's really noisy. It's all over the place. And then um, if we're trying to learn sequences, uh, we don't know where they begin or end. It may not be clearly where the beginning and end are. And they're a variable order, meaning it's sometimes in order to, do, to learn a sequence, I have to... To, to make a prediction about what's going to happen next, I have to go back multiple steps in time to know what context I'm in. And so that's, that's relating to the order of the temple thing. Now, this makes this really, really hard to do. Uh, and there are people who have been trying these kind of things for a long time. We do know that the brain's method is extremely robust. The brain does this. It does it with the really noisy cells. It does it with robustness. You can chop out parts of the brain. It seems to work. The cells die all the time. So it's robust to noise and failure. And we know that somehow it must be supported by the anatomy of the brain. 
because brains do this. And so we are going to use the anatomy as a set of constraints to figure out how the brain does this, to come up with algorithms to do this. And I'm going to walk you through that. We're going to introduce first a concept we call FDR, which stands for Fixed Sparsity Distributed Representation. This you might think of as just like, how do I represent something? And, uh, and we're going to use uh, this term. Some of you might be familiar with the idea of sparse distributed representation. Some of you might not. Um, fixed sparsity is just a small variation on that. And let me just walk you through it one time. Um, it's a really important concept. If I want to represent something, and let's say I'm going to represent it with 1,000 bits. You can think of it as 1,000 cells. Some are on, some are off, but you can think of it as 1,000 bits. Uh, well, I have various ways of doing it. At one extreme, you can do what they call a grandmother cell representation. I can tell each bit represents one thing. So there's a bit for the grandmother. If you see your grandmother, that cell fires in your ear. That's it. Um, now, in this case, you really only have a thousand things you can represent. I got one for grandma, one for grandpa, one for dog, one for cat, whatever. But the bits are independent. They don't, they don't you know, I, if I say, what's, what's this bit mean? You can tell me. It is not robust. If I lose grandmother bit, then I wouldn't be able to perceive grandma, would I? So it's, it, there's no robustness to it at all. If I swap them around, it's not going to work. At the other extreme, we have what is called fully distributed representation. You can think like ASCII. Um, this case, I could have two to the, if I have a thousand bits, I'd have two to the thousandth possible states. Um, I'm using the maximum way of representing information here. The bits are not independent. If I look at an ASCII code, which is an 8 bit fully distributed representation, and I said, well, what's what bit mean? It doesn't really mean anything. It's, it's only dependent on what all the other bits are doing. So it's not, they're not independent. And it's also not robust. Uh, in general, if I change a bit in an ASCII code, then it, I get a completely different value. It's not like that. What we want is something in between. We want something what we call sparse distributed. In this case, we can imagine, let's say, 10% of those bits are on and 90% are off. So uh, I have 100 bits that are ones and 900 bits of zeros. And I can look at all the different ways I can represent that. So in this case, I have 1,000 choose 100 possible states. All the ways I can choose 100 out of 1,000. That's a very, very big number. It's much, much smaller than 2 to the thousands, but it's still a very, very big number. In this kind of representation, the individual bits can have meaning. They can be somewhat independent, like in, and it's a combination of them that tells you what you're actually looking at. And then it is robust. It turns out, and I won't walk you through all of this, that in sparse distributed representations, if I take a bunch of representations, um, and I just took random, let's say I took 10,000 random, random points in this space, that they won't overlap much at all. That is, they'll almost completely be orthogonal from each other. And therefore, I can change bits. I can drop them out and so on. And I, and I can still tell what pattern I've got. Uh, there's some really nice things about sparse distributed representations. So we're going to do everything now in sparse distributed representations. In the past, in the meant that we did this in a, in a sort of way, but not in a robust way. And we've now just in, in, uh, embraced it completely. I call it fixed sparsity distributed representations because we want to try to keep the sparsity level constant um, as we go through this thing. And it's important for some aspects of it. So you don't want it being, you know, 100 bits one time and 500 bits on the next time. You want to stick to some sparsity level. Okay, so the questions we want to ask, ask, answer now are the following. How can we use the sparse representation, sparse distributed representations to achieve spatial pooling, <coughs> temporal pooling, I mean sequence memory and temporal pooling? And we're going to look through the cortex for answers. All right, so put on your biology hats here. Um, was I going to talk more about that? No, I was going to jump right into it here. Oh, oh I, have to, I know I didn't. I got to switch to my other presentation. There we go. So I got a new format. Sorry for you on that. Um, but I did not have time to convert these together here. So we are now going to look at a bit of neuroscience. Now, for the neuroscientists in the room, which I don't think there are many, you're going to say, oh, this is an oversimplification. But for the rest of you, you're going to be, your head's going to be swimming uh, probably a little bit here. Um, so I'll try to just keep it as simple as I can. This is representing one little section of the neocortex, a little slice of the neocortex. It's like a, a, a sideways picture of one node, if you will. And there's some organization here. There's different layers of cells. This is not like the levels in the hierarchies. This is different layers of cells, typically five layers of cells and another layer. And you'll see that the cells, those are represented by the little circles in there, they have a, a, both a columnar and a laminar uh, point. That is, we can tell that the, all the cells in a particular layer are similar in, in the sense that they're connected together in a certain way. But there's also a vertical orientation, which is called the column. And that's mostly because the cells in the vertically aligned tend to have the same receptive field properties. They tend to represent the same thing, uh, especially in a feed-forward way. So if I put a simple pattern in, I say all those cells will represent the same basic input. So these guys vertically sort of represent the same thing. 
Um, but there's this horizontal organization as well. Input comes into the cortex. This is a big bundle of nerve fibers. It generally projects to layer four and, to, and then to layer three, and then it, and all the cells here project up to the next level. So there's really, this is the feed forward pathway. It goes from layer four to layer three, then out again. And finally, if I look at the individual cells here, um, and you look at the connections on them, they have thousands of synapses, thousands of connections to other cells. Only about 10% are feed forward connections. So the feed forward signal is about 10% of the connections here. 90% are horizontal connections between nearby cells. And that's a big clue about how this whole thing. This is a this is structure you see everywhere in the in the cortex. Doesn't matter what mammal, doesn't matter what sensory organization, uh, what modality, where you are, it's like this everywhere. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest is, the, oh, there's one more thing I want to talk about here. There's another important organization principle, is that there's a lot of inhibition, which I've represented by these red cells. And I'm just going to simplify as much as I can to say that when a column is active, it tries to disable adjacent columns. That's one stuff. If a column becomes active, it says, I'm going to try to shut down the other guys. Essentially, that's creating sparseness. It says, all right, I'm winner. Nine of you guys got to be losers. And they compete. The strongest guy gets the win. The other guys get to lose. And then we also do that at the cellular level. If a cell is active, it tries to shut down its neighboring cells. And they're competing in that way, too. And so this creates a sparse activization at the cellular and the column level. All right. Um, so what we're going to now I'm going to argue is that I can look at just a single layer of cells. We're going to talk about like a layer three cells. And it's going to do everything that an HTM node has to do. I'm going to argue that that layer of cells, and we're going to look at it in a lot of detail here, can do spatial pooling, temporal pooling, and sequence memory. Um, and uh, we're going to go through this in a little bit more detail here. But the spatial pooling is essentially, essentially I'm going to have a spark that, uh, sparse activation of columns. Sequence memory is how cells change from one to the other. And temporal pooling is how the cells remain active during sequences. And we're going to walk through this in some detail. So let's just talk about the spatial pooler. This is like I've got the raw data coming into the node. I'm now trying to put it into a format I can actually learn sequences from. And we're going to put that format in a sparse distributed representation. Um, we're going to do this in an incredibly simple way that actually really works well. The incredibly simple way is, I'm gonna, here's my node in the hierarchy. This is my node in the HTM, one of the, in the big hierarchy of nodes. And I'm just going to assume in this picture I showed like 500 columns, 500 columns of cells. Now, of course, this is a two-dimensional sheet where I'm showing it like a, just a section here. And now I have some input space. The input space is fairly large. Let's say I have 10,000 inputs. You can imagine this like a 100 by 100 pixel array in a, in a picture. 10,000 things coming in. And what I'm going to do is, um, for each one of my columns, I'm going to have it randomly connect to some subset of the input space. So let's say 200 bits. Random. Doesn't really matter. And I do that for every 500 of these guys. So 500 guys are looking at subsampling of the input space. This is similar to what we see in the brain. Um, and, um, and now, if I get for any input here, any input, it's going to, these columns are going to intersect that input varying amounts. Just to illustrate this uh, in sort of a little picture, imagine here I have a visual space, 100 by 100 pixels, and I show t the two coincidence detectors, two columns, the green one and the, and, the, and, the, and the blue one, and they're sort of randomly in here. But if I put some pattern on here, uh, like this A, uh, just, this is just uh, give you the idea, not, this is not how we recognize an A, um, you'll see that it intersects one of these patterns a lot more than the other. It intersects the blue one a lot more than the, red, than the green one. If we do this, and we, we, we look at all the coincidence detectors, all the columns, and we figure out, well, how much they interact. You always get this sort of binomial distribution here, where you get some, inter some overlap the input a lot, and, and the rest a lot less. And all we're going to do is we're going to pick the top percentage and make those the winners, make them, give them an on value, and all the rest are going to be shut off. Um, that's a very simple idea. There's no learning here yet. It's just purely a, a subsampling, random subsampling space. But even without learning, this does extremely well. We've tested this in a lot of different ways. And how do we know it's doing well? Um, what we want to happen here is we want to take this incredibly complex input. So 10,000 bits of varying activity. That is, it could be 1,000 bits on or 5,000 bits on. We don't really know. We're going to take this input and we're mapping it onto a much smaller space of, in this case, let's say 50 out of 500 columns that are active. Um, so we are, this creates a, a fixed distributed representation. It reduces the size of the problem from 10 to the 2, 2 to the 10,000 to 500 choose 50, which is a teeny reduction, a huge reduction in the size of the space. But the important thing is that overlapping patterns in the input space, meaning things that are spatially similar in, in the input space, we're just talking spatial now, 
uh, are also overlapping in the FDR space, that are overlapping in the sparse distributed representation space. And the other thing that we want to happen is that things that are unique down here, so things that don't overlap in the input space, do not overlap in the FDR space. Technically, this isn't guaranteed to happen because many patterns here map onto the common pattern here, but practically it never happens because these are such large numbers, it just doesn't happen. We've tested this, and I won't go through this. These are just charts to show you that we've done a lot of work on this, and you can test for discrimination in very high volume, like storing many, you know, passing many, many patterns that are discriminable, and you ask, can I discriminate it before I put it through the FDR spatial pool and after? And the answer is yes, it's very immune to, to background noise and occlusion. Um, and these charts, if I were to walk through them, basically showed that. So we basically have a very simple mechanism for creating sparse distributed representations from very complex inputs, um, and they have desirable properties. And, uh, and we're going to leave it at that. Uh, I'm not going to walk We're just going to assume that that works. Now we have to do the hard stuff. We have to go on to the second thing that a node has to do. The second thing a node has to do is it has to learn sequences of patterns. So now we're going to learn sequences of sparse distributed representations, sequences of these cell or column activities on and off, on and off. So I've shown two sequences, I've shown two patterns here. This is a, a, a spatial, uh, a fixed distributed representation uh, at time zero, and here's at time t minus one. So I'm going to see this one and this one. So you can imagine, as I'm experiencing patterns in the world, um, they change on and off, like my speech and so on, and they're constantly changing. And what we want to do is we want to somehow learn the pr progression from from you know, one pattern to the next pattern to the next pattern, so on. We want to do it in a fairly clever, sophisticated way. Well, we can start with a very simplistic way that doesn't really work. We could say, well, let's for, for every active column at this time t equals zero, we will, we will form a memory of what the previous state was. So you can think of this like a cell and says, okay, this cell is going to learn what the pattern and all the previous cells are at, that were active at that time. So there's 50 that are active, so this says, okay, when I see this pattern of 50 activity up here, I'm next. It's sort of like you know, looking back and saying, well, I got active now. Let me see what was, what was active before. And I'll just, when I see that pattern, I become active in advance. And if I did this, I could essentially follow one state, one step in time. I could, I could learn, if I did this to every one of these columns, everyone that's active, I could say, well, when I see this pattern, then all these guys would become active. And I've, I've learned one transition. I hope that's clear. Um, but that is not very useful, uh, obviously. Uh, so that's just describing uh, what, we, what I just said here. Um, but we're going to fix this in a, in a very important way. We're going we're to basically say we're going to use multiple cells, that is multiple states, per column. And so instead of replacing this with the concept of a column, we're going to replace it with some states. And that creates a very interesting sequence memory. And so I'm now showing the same picture. Again, this is a node in an HTM, which is also a little section of cortex. We're looking at, in the layer of the cortex, we're looking at a, a, a series, in this case, again, 500 columns. And I'm going to say each column has got some number of cells in it. Um, and I'm going to show here 20. Nothing, there's nothing magic about that. In a real brain, it's anywhere, depending on its layer, it's anywhere from 4 to 15, something like that. Um, so, uh, so we have 20 cells per column, so we now have 500 columns, but we have 10,000 cells total. These are numbers that are completely believable in biological terms. Um, now, what's important here is that all the cells here represent the same bottoms-up input. So th this column would respond to some bottoms-up input, but we're going to have them represent different things in the context of a sequence. So uh, in the context of a sequence, we will pick an individual cell in each column to be active. And so, you know, it's like all the cells mean the same bottoms-up thing, but in the context of a particular sequence, we're going to say we're in this particular sequence now in, in this representation. And you can, just very quickly, you can say that there's a lot of ways to represent the same bottoms-up pattern. So if I take the same distributed representation, now that I, I can mix and match individual cells in those columns, I have two to the 50 ways to represent a single bottoms-up input. And therefore, I can learn a lot of sequences that repeat elements and things like that. So here's how we do it. Uh, roughly, I'm giving you a very simplistic explanation of this, but I think it will capture all the essence of it. In a sequence, while we're in a sequence, we're going to have one cell active at each point in time. So here's time t minus 1. Here's times t equals 0. So I have this set of columns. I'm only showing three columns. Remember, there's 50 in this particular example, but I'm not going to draw them all. But imagine there's 50 of these columns that are active. 500, so 450 are inactive. 50 that are active. I'm showing three active ones. And each one of those is showing a single cell. And, um, and now we can go from cell, we can go from uh, time t minus 1 to time t equals 0, we make this transition, and now we can have the cells themselves can remember specific things. So this cell can say, look, well, what cells were active before? 
There were 50, so I'm only showing three here. He said, well, if I can remember all 50, then I would be able to do, recognize this previous state. And I can do the same for this guy and the same for the, all the other 50. They all independently learn this way. Um, we're going to assume that this is done. These are synapses formed on a cell's dendrite. Um, and, uh, but this is impractical for a cell to learn in a brain. We know that brains, the cells in the brain cannot connect to all the previous cells that are active, even in a small region. Goodness for us is that we don't need to. Um, and what we're going to do is, instead of, instead of trying to store all the things, it turns out it's good enough just to connect to a few of them. So in this particular case, even though I have 50 columns that are active, if I just connect to four or three or five, that's almost as good. It's like, it's like virtually perfect. And that has, comes from the nature of sparse distributed representations. I do not need to connect to everything. I only need to connect to a few things, and the chances of an error are minuscule. I, I'm not going to walk you through the math on that. You'll just have to take my word for it. You can ask me later about it. So we want to make this practical. Um, and that's what brains look like. It looks like on brains, in, in a neuron, you only need to have a few synapses along this, a section of a dendrite to actually capture, get that cell excited. So we're going to do that. I've showed that here in a little picture here. I'm now sort of pretending I have a little cell here. And it's from one of these active cells. I'm showing little, five little synapses on it. And that is basically subsampling the active space here. The way you might think about it is if you are a cell, you have this, you have this dendrite, which I hope everyone has some knowledge of what a dendrite might look like. It's a, I'm a cell body, and I've got this process coming out. And I form synapses along there. Um, their idea is that there are, there are axons from other cells that come nearby, and I want to form synapses based on what I... I what, ones come nearby. So I'm subsampling from the whole space. I might form five, four, five actual synapses. And, and what we know from neuroscience is that a small section of the dendrite, if I have, if I have a, few action, a few synapses that are active at the same time, it can cause that cell to fire. And that's all we need to do. This is the basics of how we went about designing a sequence memory of sparse distributed patterns. Um, if you don't care about the neuroscience, you can forget the neurosciences, but you want to capture the essence of it from, from this. Um, so I already talked about the chance of error is very, very small. Uh, one thing I didn't mention here is that it turns out also that you can re-overload a cell. That is, I can use a cell in multiple segments, uh, multiple sequences, and it doesn't cause an error up to a certain point. That is, I can mix and match uh, on the same dendritic segment uh, multiple connections. This isn't a neuroscience finding. This is a theoretical finding that we've, we've figured out. And uh, we've tested it, and it works just fine. So there's a lot of robustness in this system, and it allows us to get the capacity up very, very high. Um, so here, basically, I'm showing three sequences and in uh, three stages in time. And if I want to learn the first thing, when a first pattern comes in, then the next pattern comes in, and the next pattern comes in, we basically have a rule that when, a, when you have a novel pattern coming in, that is, you, there's no expectation. We basically said all the cells in the, in the column fire. There's evidence for this in neuroscience, so that's not a bad assumption. And then we pick cells that we're going to learn on, we pick cells we're going to learn on, and, we, and so we form some synapses here which connect to the previous state, we form some synapses here connect to the previous state, and so on. We repeat this. Does this work? It, it, it works beautifully. Uh, I'm going to skip the inferences here for the moment. Um, uh, we've modeled this in many different ways, all since October. And here's some statistics of, of one particular test here where we had a, you know, the same one I'm showing, 500 columns, 20 neurons per column. Uh, the bottom line is you can, you can learn very long, uh, high-order sequences or lots of shorter sequences, and the system is extremely robust to noise and failure. Uh, that is, you can drop out bits, you can drop out columns, you can do all kinds of stuff. Um, and it's really good at inference. I can play back a pattern which is a really noisy version of the previous sequence, and it picks it right up. Uh, no problem whatsoever. I'm not going to, again, walk through all the, the details of these charts, but again, here we're showing some, some of the noise immunity. So on a particular experiment where I learned some sequences, we can say, what, what happens with occlusion? Meaning if, I take at, if I'm supposed to have 50 columns active, and I occlude some, I drop them out, I make some of them blank or non-active. Well, in some, you know, I can get up to almost 50% noise here. I can drop out half of them, and I'm still able to track these sequences extremely well. Uh, the same we can do for background noise. We'll get through it again. A very high, uh, you can tolerate a very high signal to noise ratio. So this is great. We don't need complex cells. We don't need complex rules. We don't. The sparse distributed representation is the key, and and we can learn these things extremely well. Okay, now we're on to the the last and the hardest part. And I hope I can do it. Um, we want to talk about how we do temporal pooling in using these sparse distributed nodes. And um, 
Uh, and so the question is, how do we form stable outputs during learned sequences? And the answer is going to be to get every cell to extend activity during sequences. Every cell in a layer actually projects up to the next uh, region of the cortex. And at least in like layer three it does. And so every cell itself is an output. Every cell is part of the temporal puller, uh, if this theory is correct. And the question is, how do we get them to do this? And this is going to stretch your mind a little bit. I've never been able to get people to really understand this in one presentation. I, I, I'm going to do my best. We're going to start with one, a picture of a neuron. This to give you a little background here. This is a typical pyramidal cell from the cortex. Almost all the uh, cells we're talking about here, other than the inhibitory cells, look something like this. And so you've got a cell body, you've got these, these what we call basal dendrites down here. We're going to ignore the, the apical dendrite at the moment. I've written about what I think is going on, but we're not going to talk about that today. So this is a layer. You have a whole bunch of cells like this in this layer, millions of these cells in here. They all have these, uh, these basal dendrites and these synapses all along them, these connections. And then there's this axon, which is the output of the cell, which uh, goes to the next region. If you looked at the details of a, of a dendrite, it's a little thin little tube, a process. And all along the edges are, are, are these connections, synapses. And this is my caricature of what it looks like. It doesn't really look like this, but you get the idea. And one thing we've learned in the last 10, 15 years is that there's this idea of an active integration zone, that in a, in a small area of the dendrite, like 40 microns uh, or less, if you, have, if you have several synapses that are active at the same time, above a certain threshold, uh, it creates a nonlinear event that is, you, it's, like a, it's like an AND gate. It says, like, if I got a bunch of these active at the same time, then we generate uh, a, an active event which causes the cell body, which can cause it the, the, the fire to spike. Uh, and this is going to be key to the understanding how this whole thing works. Okay. Uh, what I'm basically going to argue here is that a neuron like this, in the right context of the inhibition, does all the three things we want it to do. Uh, the synapses that are near the cell body, and I'm not showing them here, but there are the synapses near the cell body, these are primarily the ones that are feed forward. Uh, and and this, is, this is known. So they're the feed forward. And we also know that near the cell body, it, is, it acts differently. It's like a linear summation, which is what we needed for our spatial puller. You don't get this effect that you get further out on the dendrite. So, uh, and then the sequence memory is, are basically connections that are just out a little bit further from that. That's what I was just describing, how we learned sequences. And then I'm going to argue that throughout the rest of the dendritic branch, we're actually doing temporal pooling. We're going to use connections to previous points in time to learn, get the cell to fire repeatedly. Now it gets worse, doesn't it? So, so now we have, I'm showing you four time steps. Again, um, uh, this is four sets of time of the exact same cells showing at different points in time different columns that are active. Right, so we're going through a sequence of spatial, uh, temporal and spatial patterns here. But remember, these same cells here in this layer are the same cells in this layer, same cells in this layer, and same cells in this layer. We're just looking at them at different points in time, and at different points in time, different ones are active. Now I'm going to create a dendrite. And this is, this is what I want. I'm trying to show conceptually what I want, not physically what, what it looks like. Conceptually what we want is we want a cell, and this is the dendrite of that cell, a dendrite of that cell, we wanted to form some connections with the state of time, the state of the system at some previous time minus one, and another set of connections at previous time minus two, and another set of connections at previous time minus three. I'm showing this as it was a discrete time. There's nothing in this theory that's about discrete time. It just helps to pick, draw pictures of it. This actually can happen continuously in time, but this will help you visualize what's going on. So if, if this cell had these connections, when it saw this pattern some time ago, it would spike. And if it sees this pattern some time ago, it spikes. And if it sees this pattern some time ago, it spikes. And then when it gets the bottoms up input, it spikes. And so we would basically, the cell would, would, would stay on during a sequence leading up to its bottoms up input. It's predicting its own activity. It's saying, I recognize this pattern. I saw this before. I've learned that when I see this pattern, and this pattern, and this pattern, I'm supposed to be, I'm, I'm going to happen. I'm going to be active. And I learned to predict that in time. And how does it do that? I'll give you all the flavor for it, but not all the details of it. Um, I think this is just saying what I just told you. Yes, it's saying what I just told you, so I don't need to go over it again. Um, let's think about what the output of a region of cells might look like if we did this temporal pooling. This little chart up here, I'm theoretically showing you ten, those 10,000 cells in the layer. I'm not showing them all, I'm just showing a small subset of them. And I'm looking at it over time. 
And we can see at one point in time there's some set that are active, and another point in time another set are active, and another point in time another set are active, and another point in time another set are active. This is what we would get if we didn't do any temporal pooling. This is what the sequence memory would look like. So, but after I've done temporal pooling, these same cells come on here, but they extend previously in time. And what you see is here is they become blurred. They, they blur back in time. And what you have here is at, it, this whole activity is being passed to the next spatial pooler. If I remember what the spatial pool is like, but it, it basically, it, it in some sense, blurs the changes. And it turns out that the spatial pool behaves well with this. It essentially says it'll, it'll create a slower changing output, given that these guys are overlapping in time. And this, uh, this is what we want to happen, and I'm not going to prove to you that it does the right thing, that it remains discriminability and all that kind of stuff, but we've done a lot of these tests, and we're pretty certain that it's doing exactly what we expect it to do. Um, I'll give you a flavor for how this is done. This is the character of a cell, its axon, and, um, and then a dendrite. And in the idea here is that um, when a particular area on the dendrite occurs, like here, these little green dots mean this one is active. And it says, OK, I, I recognize this pattern. Um, it causes the cell to create a spike. The cell sends what's something called the back action potential up here, and it tells it to learn the next set of synapses. It says, OK, well, I just fired. Let me make some connections to the state that's out there right now. And it turns out that will represent things a little bit further back in time. And if you do this over and over again, and it took a, I had to go make sure that the, the neuroscience supports this, but it does. If you do this over and over again, and you repeat the sequences, like I play the sequence again and again, you will learn, the cell will learn to fire further and further back in time. Um, and this explains, if this is right, it explains why we have to repeat things to learn them. It's interesting, we can learn a, a sequence very rapidly. So can this model. But if I want to conceptualize it, if I want to form a deeper meaning, I have to practice. And I have to repeat it. And that's what this is doing. And I think that's matching the psychology in place. Um, so again, you know, we form new synapses, new connections further and further back in time. The distal synapses are ones that represent the furthest back in time. And, um, and then there's no clock here. There's no concept. So cells that are lower levels in the hierarchy will work at one sort of temporal time span. And ones that are higher up in the hierarchy will do the exact same process, but they're going to work at a different set of time spans. We just get slower and slower responses as we go up. I realize there's a lot to this. I'm trying to give you the flavor for it. Um, uh, I want to just, I'm, I'm really very close. I'm almost done here. Uh, we're very excited about this. Uh, it is a really interesting biological theory. There are no good theories about why synapses form on the dendritic branches of, of, of cells out like that. Um, it's a very impoverished area, and we have a very strong theoretical backing for this. And we've now done significant testing to prove that all this stuff works in the last four months. So we've implemented all aspects of this. Um, and we've tested each component, the, the spatial pooler, the sequence memory, and the temporal pooler. We've tested it for robustness and, and for function. Uh, we've verified that if you build a hierarchy from spatial pooler to temporal pooler, spatial pooler to temporal pooler, spatial pooler, you increase the temporal stability without losing discrimination, uh, which is the key here. It's easy to create temporal stability if you just blur everything or just keep things on, but you don't want to do that. Uh, and we've, been, we've verified, but not completely, that some of the generalization properties that we want to see exist, but we have a lot more to do in this area. Uh, but I'm confident it's going to work out. It's, it's, it, it hangs together extremely deal. So we have lots to do still. We're working on all kinds of issues related to permanency and forgetting now the changing in statistics of the data. So at one point in time, you learn something. and another point in time, you, the world changes, and you have to learn new things. How, do, how does this all work? We're doing this in a couple of domain areas. We're, we're actually working in vision, and we're trying to do the same thing in language, believe it or not. I'm not going to go through how we do that. Um, and uh, we are running into issues of memory and processing because we've, we've created a, a system that actually has a lot more, although it's more biologically realistic, it creates a lot more um, uh, um, processing and memory issues. We do not model this as a neural net model. We take these concepts I've just described to you in neural, neural terms, and we convert them into machine language, or machine learning terms. Um, we always be able to make that map back and forth. But it's not like, oh, we have too many cells or too many synapses. It's not quite that simple. Uh, we we model all these connections as these sparse matrices. And, and it's not like we have little neurons that we're putting together. It's, it's, a, a, it's a softer model of a biological process. We, um, so we're running into some issues of, of, of processing requirements. This has gotten a lot slower, so we have to spend a lot of time speeding it up again. And we have yet to document and publish this. This is all brand new, and, um, and you're the first people to hear it, um, at least outside of a small uh, internal community. 
Um, and I hope you found that interesting. Thank you. Uh, if you need to leave, you can leave. I'm happy to take some questions for now. i got some time. Um, but if you have to go, don't be embarrassed to do so. Uh, but if there's questions from the audience, I'd love to take them. Right here. Yeah. Is there anything published on this research? No. Uh, there's a patent filing. We did that. And um, uh, this is really it. Uh, one of my goals this year is to, uh, very soon, is to really get a, a publishing effort on the way. Um, there's some really interesting ideas in here, and we need to vet them, and we need to get them tested by people. I've talked to a few neuroscience friends um, under non-disclosure just to make sure that, you know, I'm pretty good on the neuroscience, um, but I ran on the run by a few other, you know, independent people just to make sure that, you know, they said, oh, Jeff, you missed something really big here, and, and so far I haven't seen any of that, so there's some level of verification there. My confidence mostly comes from the fact that uh, we've been working on these problems for a long time. We have a very large set of constraints that we know we have to solve. And when you find a solution that meets a gazillion of these constraints at once, you feel really confident about it. Um, so even once we conceived of this, and this all happened within about a week, um, I was virtually certain it was going to work. But we've been going through four months of testing to verify it. So that's where we are. But it has not been published. But hopefully by the end of this year, uh, it'll, at least by the summer, we should have something submitted. Um, and, um, and then we'll try to work that. And we might also do a separate white paper and put it on our website so people can read about it. Yeah? Jimmy, how high level concepts can you learn exactly from visual input? Yeah, so the question is, how high-level concepts can you learn from visual input? Uh, I'm not sure you're asking that how high level have we been able to achieve, or in general in a human? I said that you. Us, what we've achieved. Yeah, not very high. I mean. Uh, we, are, we are working on non-human-like systems completely, right? We're, even when we do like a vision system, we're doing it completely devoid of any sensory motor interaction with the world. Uh, we're learning a very impoverished world. We're just saying, okay, here's the things we, you know, like when we did the people tracker. You know, we said, okay, it's, it, the world is full of moving things, and there's some are people and some are not. <laughs> and, you know, that's a high-level high concept that we, we, we strive to achieve there. Um, uh, it, 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 so the answer is not very high level, but you know, in the context of what we're trying to achieve, that's a reasonably high level concept. It's a person. So in that person example, do you distinguish between people and dogs? Do you, do we you we know? distinguish between people and people and non-people. So we're really good at saying it's not it's not a person. It's a dog. It's a you know it's not a person. It's, but we don't tell you what all the other things are. Um, we basically say it's a person or it's not a person. And it does a fairly good job at that. Uh, you know, we, we looked at doing other classifications, like, okay, well, do I want to do car, or do I want to do dog? And, um, and from a practical point of view, we ran into problems with that. Part of it was performance issues, speed, they want to do this at four milliseconds a frame. Um, and there was other issues, having to get labeled data is very difficult. We spent a lot of time getting labeled data. You know, you get all these videos, someone has to label them. Uh, if you've done any work in this field, you know that's a huge issue. Um, and, and part of our algorithms weren't up to the task. Uh, and so, you know, to be honest, they weren't up to the task of doing, doing like, you know, a thousand categories and things like that. But we do do a very good job, and we don't get fooled. A person with a stroller still causes a, a person. A person on a bicycle still causes a person. Um, because we showed it movies of those things. We trained it on those things. Um, but, you know, look, I'm being honest with you. The state of the art is where it is. It's not, you know, we're not thinking, breathing machines here. Uh, we're not trying to do that yet. We're just trying to get the basics working. Uh, down here. Yeah. Okay, uh, the question, I'll try to repeat it. Uh, there's a number of different time scales that I talked about here. Uh, there's delays in, in the axons, there's delays in the transmissions, there's delays from region to region, and things like that. I think that I get this. Sort of, and what is the range of these things? Um, so, uh, in our models, uh, we do not try to account for uh, transmission delays that could be very important in the brain. So, you know, it takes a few milliseconds for uh, a, a signal to propagate a, an axon. Um, 
And I can give you my, you know, so in our models, we don't try to capture that. We do this in software, we do this with double buffering, we, you know, we do software concepts for these things. We're not trying to capture it. We don't think it's essential to capture it. In a real brain, I believe it is essential. Uh, because it turns out that in real brains, um, you know, we're, there are spikes on these axons. They're not active or non-active, they're spikes. And the spikes have to come within really short periods of time with one another for them to be effective. So I have to multiple ones at the same time within a few milliseconds. Um, and, but I don't believe that is, from an information theory, important. It's really important from a biology point of view. That's how biology got the cells to work. And so things like, uh, like the, the rhythms in the brain, the beta and the gamma and the alpha rhythms, we don't think are essential for um, the information theory. We think they're essential for getting these things spiked up, to, lining up and spiked at the same time. So I'm giving a sort of a side answer to your question here. Um, we, at the moment, we do not actually have any explicit uh, encoding of time. We, we can run our experiments fast or slow, um, and it's, it's all a matter of relative time in the hierarchy. Now, how much of a time difference do I get between level and level in the hierarchy depends on how good a job of temporal pooling I do. And we've done some tests on this. So if, I, if I'm able to do more temporal pooling at a particular level, then the next level actually changes more slowly than the first level. I can look at the transition times and so on. And the ability to detect, the ability to do more temporal pooling, that is get these cells to fire more and more time, really has to do with the statistics of the data. Um, not all data can be predicted in time. If you're not looking at the right things, you're not trying to, you won't get it. So it really depends on the data how much temporal pooling you can do. How much temporal pooling you can do tells you how much um, uh, slowness you achieve as the hierarchy goes, as you go up the hierarchy. So, you know, those are, but we try to avoid any sort of concept of real time. The, the only time we've, we've not done that is we have some ideas for like global forgetting where, you know, we say, hey, look, if you haven't used these synapses in a long, long time, they're probably getting useless. You sort of start decaying them and they go away. Um, uh, but, but, you know, we've, we've seen, give me a, a specific answer to your question, we've been able to achieve on sort of artificial data very easily to get to like a four to seven um, uh, slowness factor going from level to level in the hierarchy. Uh, but it really depends on the data and how it works. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I... <coughs> You were asking how fast is the biological stuff? Oh. And how long does it take to grow a new scientist? Okay, so you were asking biological questions. I thought you were asking questions about our model. I'm sorry. Um, oh, that was interesting, too. Okay, so um, uh, biologically, this is, there's some interesting questions here. Uh, you know, transmission delays along axons vary depending on the axon is myelinated or not myelinated, meaning it has a little fatty sheet like an insulator on a wire. It's like these are... Uh, you can think of it that way. So different axons project at different times. But you could think, you know, a typical transmission delay from reason to reason the cortex might be 10, 15 milliseconds, something like, or, or a little bit less, depending on which path you take. Um, the other question about how fast synapses can be formed is fascinating. It used to be believed that people used to believe that synapses were fairly stable, uh, and, or that they, formed, or they, 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 they were there and you could strengthen them or weaken them. But we now know, and it's amazing work, that it can be formed really rapidly from nothing. There's movies, literal movies you can watch of synapses going weak, you know, and like connecting in real time. Um, and this sort of changed the way people thought about this, which is our model requires this. Our model requires that you can, in one or a few presentations, say, you know, there wasn't a connection here, or there is a connection here, or there was a weak connection, and there's a strong connection. And uh, that was a real sea change in the understanding of how synapses work on dendrites. Um, and we require that. So uh, we can, we've done this, we're, we've been doing all of our tests so far with a very simplistic learning model. We're learning in one presentation. Um, we're now implementing a, a, a version where we're learning a little bit slower than that. And there's some reasons you might want to do that for certain types of data. That is, you might have to see something a few times before you learn the sequence. You always are going to have to learn it multiple times to do the temporal pooling. You're always going to have to um, cycle through that multiple times. I hope I answered your question better that time. Another question, yeah. Uh, two questions, basically. So how do you learn about these biological processes? Do you have an army of mice with open skulls? Or are you working on like small living cells? Yeah. And uh, they said it's a real problem getting labeled data. So are you posing all those questions as supervised loading problems? Um, okay, so the first question is, is how do we get the biological data? We do nothing with wet labs, okay? 
There is so much biological data published out there, it makes your head swim. And if you try to just go out and say, oh, I'm going to learn all about what you know about you know, B1 cells, you're, just, you're, going to, you're going to come home depressed. There's just so much. So it turns out you do not need to do these experiments. It's out there. The problem is finding it and finding the right people to speak to and finding the right papers. And that's the hard part. So all this stuff I have here, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what's known about these things. And, but it's very difficult to find the relevant facts and know where to go and who are the right people to speak to. So I've been doing this for many, many years, and I've been honing that process. Uh, at the moment, we have some questions about, oh, well, I really like to know how this works, but I usually know the right person to call. And you can say, oh, you know, what do you know about this? And they'll tell you, right? And, um, but there's, some, there's a few areas where you know, we don't know. And I didn't give it here, but I have a whole list of predictions which come out of this theory which we don't know the answer to, but I can predict what the answer will be, and, and when we publish it, of course, we'll publish those predictions. Um, and uh, and they'll you know, be able to uh, help us understand the, theory, the validity of the theory. Uh, but you don't need to do the wet science. The other th the question is, um, I mentioned labeled data. Does that mean that everything has to be supervised? And the answer is no. Everything doesn't have to be supervised. We've done supervised experiments and non-supervised experiments. I didn't show you any of that stuff. That would have been in my long talk if, instead of the version of the short one I did, the first one. Um, and, uh, and it turns out that uh, you can do, it's a lot easier if you have supervised, supervised data. You can supervise at the top of the hierarchy, but it's not essential. We did an experiment with um, motion capture data. You know, so they put the little ping pong balls in the, the body parts, and then they run around, and then they use this to animate video games. Um, and so we had some motion capture data, and we had, um, and we did unsupervised, unsupervised learning on that. And we had sequences of people doing things. And, and it learned on its own to categorize it into running and walking and sitting and other activities, and it wasn't supervised. It didn't know what to call it. It just said, oh, I see this pattern is similar to one I've seen before, uh, things like that. But you know, the theory is consistent with unsupervised learning all along. Everything we've done, most of what we've done so far is supervised just because it's easier and quicker and it's easier to control the results and figure out what's going on. But there's nothing theoretically that says you can't do unsupervised learning on these things. Yes? Can't learn. Well, they can learn, <laughs> but they're very bad at generalizing it to a new context. Yeah, yeah. So, so what, why, where's the hippocampus here? So I'm asking, yeah, well, just because you mentioned it. Though, yeah, uh, so the question is about the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is, uh, is a, um, it, it's an older region of the brain that it predates the neocortex. It is now physically appended to the edge of the neocortical sheet. So that napkin, it's actually it's, it's on the edges of that. Um, but it does exist before then, and it's, uh, it's, it doesn't look like the cortex. There's a different architecture structure to it, uh, but it's, it's connected to the cortex also, not just physically, but information-wise. It's actually, if you look at a brain, it's the actual, at the top of the hierarchy is where it connects most to the, to the hippocampus. So if I show you the big hierarchy of the cortical regions, the top is where the, the, neocortex is, the hippocampus is. And the hippocampus is very much involved in memory formation, certain types of memory formation. And you point out if you have lesions or difficult, uh, damage to it, you can not learn certain types of things. There was, of course, a very famous patient called HM who died recently. Who they did, before they knew this, they did a, uh, they removed both sides of his hippocampus, and this poor guy could never learn anything new for the rest of his life. He lived his life literally. He said he felt like he was waking up every day. He could not remember anything since his surgery. Everything was like stuck in time. The Groundhog Day forever for this guy. If you know that movie, you guys know that movie. Um, and. Um, uh, a very sad case, actually. Um, uh, we, we have a theory about how the hippocampus relates to this, and I didn't talk about that at all today. Um, I, my belief is that for the low-level uh, learning that we talked about here, uh, sensory learning, it's not, it doesn't play a big role. It basically plays a role at the higher-level concepts and at the top of the hierarchy, beyond what I've shown in like visual perception and things like that. And one way to look at it is the following. Um, as you experience the world, there's these states to the hierarchy. And, and the states of the cell activations represent what your current thinking and state of this is. But they're constantly going away, and you don't remember most of them. I mean, you just don't remember most of you, you don't remember one hundredth of a percent of the things you experience. Um, it's the model that you're building. But the hippocampus is like a core dump. It's like a quick dump of them. It's, it, it's able to take the top of the hierarchy and quickly, and they've shown this, quickly store patterns. 
And so it's a way of sort of remembering at the moment, in some sense. It's like a way of saying, something that's happened at the top of the hierarchy, I have a way of recalling, I have a way of storing it temporarily. And, 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 the, and the evidence is that over time, if, if you're going to remember permanently, it gets transferred back onto the, onto the hierarchy. And we can think of it as like a supervisor process. Um, so I'm giving you a flavor for it. We've talked about it a lot. We've actually did some modeling of this, but we're no longer modeling it. We decided that we're going to put that aside for the moment. We don't need it to do these sort of sensory perception things. Um, but we have a reasonable hypothesis about how it hooks into the hierarchy. We've tested it a little bit. It seems to work as we thought it would work uh, in a very crude way. I don't want to over, over, overbill it. Uh, and we've kind of left it out of the picture here. But I don't think it's, it's certainly not essential for doing this kind of perceptual, uh, low-level perceptual task that we're, we're talking about here. We're out of time. Is that it? You have a flight to come. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.